Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming this morning. I'm Scott LaPointe. I'm going to try to moderate this morning's tutorial session. Um, as a reminder, and to myself, please wait before you start your tutorials until we all get the friendly cue. Um, and I think if we're ready to start, I can introduce Bart. Bart is a soon-to-be postdoc at the Max Planck <laughs> Institute, recently submitted, and one of the key developers of the Move package, and he's going to walk you through how to use the Move package for R. Thanks, Bart. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Um, we're, we're asked to do a presentation on the Brownian bridges and on the uh, uh, corridor things, the things Scott researched in recent years, and then we thought, okay, we're both using the Move package. This is a package we developed together with Kami and uh, Marco Smola um, to deal with movement data. And we thought, let's maybe it's the easiest to give a first an introduction in the Move package. And uh, therefore, I will also really encourage you, if you want to to go along, I'll shortly show the uh, link. But first, I want to tell you a bit on why we actually decided to make another package, another development. Uh, because there's already a bunch of programs out there. And a few key things led us to think that we actually, there was somewhat we needed to extend on. So first of all, we wanted to work with MoveBank. We want a seamless integration with the MoveBank data. So it would be easy to lay, load data from MoveBank, try some scripts, and then um, use them. And um, the MoveBank data is global data. So we're dealing with various projections. Uh, for some analysis, you need to have a flat uh, Cartesian coordinate system. For others, you need longitude, latitude. So somehow you need to be able to keep track of projections. And therefore, we thought it would be great to make a package to deal with movement data that's based on the very well used and very big SP and raster packages in R. And um, therefore, in, if we have an R package, we could also just do some simple, simple validation of the data. So it's basically. The goal is partly to uh, make the dealing with the movement data a lot easier. So I just want to basically walk you through some code. And I really encourage everybody who has a laptop and want to try to try it. Um, please raise your hand or raise your voice if you have questions or if it's going too quick. If it's not working for you, maybe Scott can help a little bit. I can help if it's, in general, not working. Um, so let me see. This is the URL, where is the R, the R code that uh, I'll be using today. Um, and the first thing is to uh, load the move package. Um, so first, you can just load the move package as any other package in move. And um, it would be good to, if you check if you have the most um, recent version. You can do this with, uh, which this computer hasn't. Yeah? Yeah. Wait a second. Um, here. Sorry, I had to switch computers. <laughs> it's basically an R file, and you can open it in your preferred uh, R environment. Um, I don't know what people are using. I'll be using R Studio. I think it's the most visual for the these things. Do those who want to have it have it, the file? OK, good. So other packages we'll be using is uh, Lubridate, ggmap, rcurl to download data if you want to from MoveBank, and map tools to do some basic uh, um, calculations. So in developing the Move package, um, we thought there's basically a few context. First of all, you can just have a very basic trajectory, in which we call it move. It's just a single trajectory 
it can contain an infinite amount of attributes per point. Um, it keeps track of your timestamps. It makes sure that your timestamps are in order, that the timestamps are unique, and a few of these basic requirements of how we think about um, a track. Then, but you can also have, in many cases, people study a bunch of animals, and they actually have a, what we call a move stack. So that's a collection of various um, trajectories. So then we call it a move stack, and then you can combine multiple animals, or maybe multiple tracking sessions of an animal if you tracked it one year and the next year. Or what we say, and that's many people are nowadays interested in um, segmenting trajectories. So actually storing some kind of annotation and actually formalize um, the segmentation of the trajectory. So first of all, um, the data set that we'll be using in most of the examples is a fisher. This is a Martin species that's uh, in North America. Scott knows a lot more about them. It's an animal he tracked. It's the Fisher Leroy. It's an example data set that's in the move package. And it was tracked in New York. So in order to um, load the data, let me just make sure that I loaded the newest version. we first need to find the file on disk. And in this case, this first command is just to find the file, uh, the location of the um, file where Leroy's tracking data is stored on the disk. In this case, it comes with the move package. And if you type the file, if you visualize the path, you'll see that in this case, it's stored somewhere on this computer. Everybody will have a different path. And you can just um, feed the path I mean, normally you would probably write it something like, um, and you just store it in a variable. Um, in this case, I won't run the code, but you can just store the file path, whatever the path is, in a variable. And then if the file is downloaded from MoveBank, It's as easy as using the function move and your path. If you have the package loaded. Um, and you'll just get the data loaded. So if you type the name of the object where you store the data in. Let me Um, zoom out. I want to zoom out a bit. Um, you'll get a summary of the data. In this case, it doesn't look so pretty because the screen is not so wide. But you'll get um, a basic summary of the object. So the first, it tells you it's a move object. Then you see that uh, it contains uh, 119 locations, what the bounding box is, so the coordinates, the coordinate reference system, the number of variables that are associated, the names of all the variables, the time, so this one has been tracked in 2009, in February till March. It has been tracked with a GPS. As you see here, there's some statistics about the animals, including its uh, the individual uh, taxon name, which uh, is the species name, and so on. So in case you don't have the um, file stored in MoveBank, you could also load it first through the normal R um, CSV read, or if maybe if you read it out of a database, it doesn't really matter. This can be various ways, um, but you could read it 
and then create the move object using the move function again. But in this case, you specify every time which, is, which variable is in which um, column in the data file. So here you see that we have the locations longitude, latitude for x and y. We create the timestamps, in which case, we, in this case, we have not already timestamps, so we have to create them. We define how the timestamps look like. In this case, I'll show a short summary of the data. If we first read the file, It will show you all the summaries, and you see that the um, timestamps are here stored as uh, year, day, month, or year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds. So we specify the right timestamp. Um, we, speci we can specify the name of the animal. We can specify the current projection. And specifying the projection is very useful because then later on you can uh, do transformations of the projections. So in this case, you see that we again have the um, uh, the same data object which contains all the information about the animal. Um, another option um, that we can that you can use is download the data directly from MoveBank. So say you want to run a script every day. In this case, you could just uh, Download the data directly from MoveBank. Uh, the credentials are stored in a plain text way on your computer. So don't do this on public computers or make sure that you do it in somewhere where you feel confident about it. That's because R doesn't have the facilities to accommodate password storage. So they're stored in a plain text format. But in this case, you can directly access MoveBank using a whole range of functions. So in this case, I already loaded my password. Um, in case you're using Windows, you need to make sure that you run this bit of code, because otherwise the certificate file uh, is not found by the package that makes sure that we download the data. So you can, for example, search all the studies. In this case, it will just return me one big vector with um, all the studies that are, or the titles of all the studies that are in MoveBank that are accessible to my user. So that's something, the results will always differ slightly between persons, because not everybody has access to the same data in MoveBank. And then you could also say, look, I'm no, it was something called with oil. So you say search for MoveBank studies with oil, oil in the name. And in this case, we get the oil bird study. It's a study in South America, and we can get extra information about the animal. Here we specify, so every time you see we specify an argument. So for example, we want to get information from the oil bird study, and we use the login that's stored in the credentials. And here you see that uh, now I'm returned the license agreement for this study. Um, when it was, can I see data in it? When it was created, and so on, all in a data frame format. I can also get a list of animals in this study. For example, if I do get movement animals, I'll get a list of all the animals that are uh, studied in this study. And I get some extra information, for example, what kind of sensors they were using, how they're called. Potentially, if there was other information stored with these animals, it would also be returned here. For example, if the sex was stored in MoveBank. And if you use get move bank data, you'll get actually the data set downloads. This, this takes a bit longer but now, because now it starts downloading all the locations. And one important thing here is to keep in mind that um, you need to first download the study once directly from MoveBank when you're logged in, because you need to agree to the license terms. So 
the first time you'll try this, you'll get the error that you can't get the study. And that is quite often because you first have to download the study once manually from MoveBank in order to agree to the license terms. You could also download specific animals, as here shown in the last line. So here you see that actually, it's good to show that in the last case we If we download the whole study, we get all the animals in the study. So we see that um, we get back a move stack, which is a, a collection of different animals. And you see that we have in total about 10 individuals in this case. So once we have the data loaded, there's a whole bunch of simple functions for calculating things that many people, I think at least in the beginning, would be useful um, to calculate. So for example, the number of locations, if you want the timestamps of all the observations, you can return the timestamps. Or if you want the time interval between inter observations, you can get the time lag. You can specify which units you want, uh, if you want minutes, seconds, hours, years, days. Um, let's try these things. So if you see there's in total 919 observations in the, in this case data is the Leroy data set. And if we want to get run timestamps, you get the series of all the timestamps that are associated, and we see already that it's roughly 10, 15 minutes interval, but if we do the time lag, we get all the time lags, and we could, for example, also use this to create uh, an histogram of time lag. And then I have to In this case, we see that we have many very short time intervals and a few longer ones up to roughly a thousand minutes. Mm. We could do get the ID data, so that's the data per individual. In this case, we here is all the information stored that's unique to the individual. So it will look in the data set and will look which information um, is unique to every individual. And we see, for example, that the species name, which is a property of the individual and not so much of the uh, whole data set, you don't need to repeat that every row. And so there's a whole in which time zone the like local timestamp was stored, in which UTM zone the uh, auxiliary uh, UTM data is stored. You can also convert the data set again to a data frame. Uh, if you do it with data frame data, structure tells you all the columns with a very short summary. And here you, then you'll get all the data that's uh, unique for every data point. And if you do, say, as data frame, it will return also all the other data. You can also calculate the speeds, which are returned in meters per second. And it could also, again, be useful to draw a histogram. And it could be an easy check for seeing quickly if the data is roughly OK. In this case, we don't have enormous outliers. The quickest speed is 0.8 meters per second, which is a very reasonable speed measured over 15 minutes. Or you can get the the 
the distances between locations, which are measured in meters. And they vary between only a few meters when it's resting, which is probably mostly the GPS error, to a kilometer or so. So once we have the data loaded and we can some, do some basic explorations, we could also, for example, uh, do some subsetting. It works basically like any data frame in R um, works. In this case, for example, if we only want to get the locations during the day, um, we can use the map tools package to calculate sunrise, sunset. So if you load the map tools package and get then the time, so timestamps again returns all the times that the fish are was observed. And then um, there's the function sunrisit um, in the map tools package, and that will return you the sunrise time for a set of coordinates or for a spatial points data frame, which uh, the Fisher data is, and a set of timestamps. And we'll, we'll say that we want them out as formal timestamps, and we want to have the sunrise time. Now you see that we added an extra column to the um, Fisher data set with the sunrise time. So so you see that you, uh, this is all the sunrise times, which of, are of course going to be very much the same throughout the whole data set, only vary by a few uh, minutes or within a month. Um, and we can do the same for the sunset. And you see that you can here add extra columns to the data frame like you can do with any data frame in R. You can just do make the move object dollar the name of the new column and you can assign a value to it. And then if we would want to have only the locations during the day, we can um, take the data and we say we want only those data points where the time uh, is before the sunset and after the sunrise. So here you see this will return uh, a vector with values if the location was before or after um, sunrise or before sunset and after sunrise. And then if we subset it by the square brackets, like a data frame can be subset in R, we now have only the, di the day locations of the fissure. And in this case, there are 186 locations during the day for the fissure. So then this is all very non-visual, but we could also quite easily just plot the data and that works as easy as running plot data and then you get a simple plot of the points the animal has been observed so you get the x-coordinates the y-coordinates And in this case, it's on a relatively small range because it's on longitude, latitude. Um, and then if we want to add, connect the locations that are connected, we can say we want to add the lines for the data. Um, in this case, there's lots of overplotting, so it's not so easy to see, but we could also only um, run plot data and then we want type is L, type is lines, so then we only plot the lines and in this case we see that this is the track of the fissure. You see that there is a, a 
a large part that uses over here in the north, and then there's a small corridor towards the south, and then there's a small part of the home range down there. So for the plotting, you can, uh, this is a very basic plot that doesn't look very pretty, but because it's based on the normal plotting functions in R, you can add all kinds of other uh, specifications to the plot um, and type, um, um, plot it in any way you want. So for example here, you can make the lines blue and a bit thicker if you would want that. You could also, if you want, could also label the axis properly by making long The X label is longitude, and you could change it in these ways. Um, this is a very simple plotting uh, scheme, and you could also make it prettier, for example, by downloading a map in the background with the library ggmap. In this case, we now download a map for the extent where we have the fissure, and then we say we make the data in a data frame, and then we could make a somewhat prettier plot with the, in this case, the Google Maps background. And you could vary, uh, using these general plotting schemes, you can vary and uh, elaborate on it a lot more. So in order to reproject the data, you can, um, is everybody who wants to follow somewhat there? Does the code that I <laughs> provide at work? It should work, I think, but I see some people nodding. Do you have your power cord? I do have one on the back Oh, okay. Um, so the projection works by the, on the basis of the rep how any other object is reprojected in R. And uh, we had made a small, um, or addition to the function, and that's that you could also use for move objects, the center is true. In this case, we just calculate an uh, uh, AEQD, that's a local Cartesian uh, projection, um, and that's centered around the center of your study. So in this case, if you see the projection string of the data, we see that the data is in longitude latitude. If we reproject it with center is true, we see that the new data set is in a equal or Cartesian projection with the center around the center of the study site. Um, you could also project it to other projections if you know what the projection is, and this could be very useful if you're working towards getting it in, uh, for example, UTMs or whatever local projection you're government agency who provides maybe raster data to work with uh, users. Um, so you could also make a move stack. For example, from either by loading the data from a file with multiple animals in it, but also, for example, from a list of move objects. So now I have two move objects loaded. That's um, Leroy, Leroy and Ricky. And then it's as simple as making a list out of them and stacking them together. And now we have a move stack. And if you uh, want back one individual from the move stack, you could just address it by its name. And then you'll get back only the data set, the data for Leroy in this case. So this, again, is back to a move object if we subset it by the double square brackets, as you would subset a list. If you plot a stack, you see that every animal is colored by a different color. In this case, we see that we here still have the data of Leroy, in this case in red. It just does a random coloring per individual. And uh, Ricky, the other fisher, is more in the north. Um, in order to burst the data, in this case, 
will burst it by a week. For example, if you want to calculate weekly home ranges or um, want to calculate other measures, um, you can just load Leroy again. And then we can calculate using the week function and the times. So we know the timestamps which the fish was observed. The week function is a function from Lubridate. It can provide you the week, the Julian date, whatever measure you want. And then you could um, have the data now as a bursted object. So you can do a data burst. Now you see that we have an object um, that's a move burst, again, of the 900 locations we had. You see that it now has this property of uh, the weak numbers. So it's because it, the names can't be only called numbers, but it will be X7, that's the seventh week. We have 313 locations. The eighth week, we have 264 locations, and so on. And also this, again, you could plot. Um, if you plot the points, you'll go only get the points, because in our view, we decided, and maybe somewhat arbitrary, but I think it's the most logical and useful definition for segmentation to be the period between two locations. So the period between two locations we classify as uh, either running, uh, it could be a foraging behavior, or in this case, by belonging to the week, or the start location in this case belongs to a week. Okay. Um, in this case, here you see that the track is now colored per week. Um, I think that was what I had to tell about the move package. Um, I'm welcoming any questions, suggestions. Uh, you can also email them to me later. I just had a question about the burst thing. Yeah? You can burst it. I can burst that by any time variable. I can, uh, I can put it that way. Can I call it burst? You can burst it by any arbitrary classification you want. And so you can do it by weeks, months, days, hours if you want. Um, the thing is, here I did it very simple. Um, I just look at what, in which week the start location. So I generate a vector with weak numbers. And then uh, I'll leave the last one out. So I just look at which, in which week the start location. Of course, if you get a bit more fancy or if you get many classifications, you would w maybe want to average this or find some other definition. Uh, Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Oh, uh, next question. Yeah. Um, So the question was, uh, to, there's a bunch of packages indeed. Well, the question was if you can transfer it to an L trajectory, which is the package in AD Habitat, or the way of storing trajectories in ADD Habitat. And um, yes, there is. There's, of course, a bunch of mo movement-related R packages, and they all have somewhat different assumptions. Um, what we have is the function S, and then you can take your data, and then you do L trej. I think it's l -tredge. And then it will return the data as an l object, if I'm right. Yeah. So now you see if you do data or s, open bracket data, and l -tredge, and then there's a definition of, then it converts it to an l object. And I think the inverse works as well. Yeah? Um, what you could do, I mean, I did, in this case, uh, so the question was the, what to do if you have long time gaps and you want to leave those out. Um, I'm not, 
you could, for example, use the, well, it's a bit of a tricky thing, right? Because if you have a long time get, gap, you maybe don't want to calculate statistics over this time gap, but you still want to keep the locations. Um, and in this case, you could use the time lag function. You can calculate the time lag and you say, I have a tag that takes a location every hour. If the time lag is more than three hours, maybe it gets a bit too much. And then you could use the time lag is bigger or smaller than then. You could then burst the object by this and just say, I'm going to analyze the bursts that have a small time lag. Is there more questions or do we have time? Start a little late, and we should give Bart a bit of a break before his next talk, which is in five minutes. Done. <laughs> so. mm -hmm.